So welcome, everybody. Nice to see you here, see so many faces uh, that I know and that I will hopefully meet still today. Thank you for joining our session. So today we are talking about putting theory into practice. Um, for those of you who are in the last session, we heard a lot about the challenges associated with creating nature plans, urban nature plans, mainstreaming nature-based solutions in practice. And today we're going to really help to try to give you inspiration and take apart those examples of what's worked in practice. So my name is McKenna Davis. Some of you know me uh, with two different hats on from the Clever Cities project here today and also from the Interlace project who will be joining us today in the panel with our lovely colleague Natalia. And we're going to, as I said, explore this kind of critical intersection where theory meets practice. So I think all of us know about this added value about nature-based solutions, about how important it is to mainstream them, to integrate them into policy, but actually translating this ambition into reality is often challenging. It's often very challenging in practice. So we wanted to pose the question today to draw on your experience, the experiences of our speakers, and ask how can we actually integrate nature-based solutions into the, the urban fabric of policy and governance. So we have a mix today of presentations, an interactive panel discussion. We really want to inspire collective action coming out of this discussion, coming out of your um, actions after the conference today, and try to bridge this gap between theory, so what we really want to transform our cities, to make them greener, to make them more sustainable, have this livable urban future that we're all hoping for, and implementation, so the concrete actual um, actions required to bring these dreams really to fruition. So we believe that the answers can be found within cities, within real world examples that have already taken place, that already exist, that are out there to inspire, to teach us, to learn from. So to kickstart our session, my colleague uh, Natalia, who I'll introduce in a moment, will introduce you to the Urban Governance Atlas. Some of you may know this from the Interlace Project. It's a labor of love that Natalia and I have worked on for the last two years. So we're really happy to share this with you today to provide inspiring examples of policy instruments from around the world supporting nature-based solutions. And then we're really honored to have two um, representatives here from Krakow metropolitan area and Quito joining us. Had a long trip, both of them, but are really happy that they could make it today to share their experiences of successfully mainstreaming nature-based solutions in your local context. Um, and really embracing the principles of co-creation, of cross-sectoral, um, cross-departmental, multilateral, um, multi-level collaboration and integration with different stakeholders. So we'll learn a little bit more how that worked in practice. But we don't want to just showcase our stories. We also want to learn from and engage with all of you in the room today. We know there's always a limited number of people that can sit on these four seats in the stage, but we want to give you a voice as well. So we'll have the interactive session at the end for you to ask questions, to engage, but also to share maybe some stories that are successful that you know of or that you've been involved with. So we hope today you'll leave the session full of inspiration, trying to have some tools that are practical for you to mainstream nature-based solutions and try to ensure that nature doesn't remain in the city, but it really becomes the heart of the city. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Natalia, if you want to come up here. Um, my colleague Natalia Burgos, who will introduce the Urban Governance Atlas. Natalia is a researcher at Ecologic Institute and has a background in urban planning and disaster risk reduction. So. Hello, everyone. Wow, it's very bright here. <laughs> So, um, one sec, yeah, okay, I'm very happy to be here, uh, see familiar faces, see new faces, and as McKenna just said, um, I'm very pleased to present to you some of the insights of the Urban Governance Atlas, it's a, a work that we've been doing for the last two years, as McKenna said, and we learned a lot, so we hope that you also get inspired by it and can use it a lot in your cities and different contexts. Um, so, I mean, just as a framework of how we started thinking about it. So we knew we had to make an urban governance atlas. Uh, that was kind of basically our proposal in the Interlace project, but, but then you start asking, okay, so what does that mean to mainstream NBS into policies, right? It's not 
So it seems like a simple question, but then when you really try to make it happen, it's not that clear. So we started saying, okay, there is an ambition to mainstream MBS. There are different frameworks that tell us how positive that could be, but then we really don't know what sort of policy instrument is that we are looking for. It's like we are looking for nature-based solutions policies and the solution is that every city in the world has a nature-based solution policy, or is it like what sort of things is that we are talking about? What type of instruments? And not only what type of instruments also, but what sort of arrangements, kind of this governance uh, perspective, we need to make in order to work for nature-based solutions and make nature-based solutions happen. So is this, we call it like the shift from government to governance. What is it that it entails to the mainstreaming processes? And all this, we find a lot of nice literature around it. We got inspired and then we said, okay, but what we are lacking really practical um, examples of how actually the cities are making this happen. Because the fact that nature-based solutions are some sort of a recent uh, concept, more in the Latin American context, for example, doesn't mean that people is not working for nature over the years. So we made an effort also to identify how we could do that. So this was kind of, I, I'm just taking, telling you how was our thinking process that I hope that can also inspire you when you are working in your own policies. And then we came to the Urban Governance Atlas. So the Urban Governance Atlas is a collection of 250 policy instruments from around the world. Although our focus is European cities and Latin American cities, uh, with this we aim to foster ecologically coherent and inclusive planning for urban ecosystem restoration and green space planning. It's inspire global action and represent diverse contexts. This is very key um, aspect that we wanted to feature. We are all doing something innovative. We are all creating different spaces uh, of innovation. So we really wanted to gather those in the atlas. Uh, well, um, this infographic we summarizes like two years of work. So I just hear some key numbers. Uh, so I already said it's 250 good practice policy instruments. That means policy instruments that support the uptaking on nature of nature-based solutions. Uh, we co-created this, it was not just McKenna and me and the Ecologic team, but we co-created this with 48 organizations, so also we had some learnings in terms of what does that mean to co-create a product with such a big number of people and organizations involved. Uh, also, we are fe featuring 41 countries on our examples, and we worked with four types of policy instruments. We decided, basically, we clustered them out of uh, our own expertise and also by some um, doing some research and we have an interlaced advi advisory board that also helped us to find uh, categories that would hopefully uh, gather uh, a gray uh, array of nature of policy instruments that can support nature-based solutions, which is very interesting exercise because we wouldn't think that basically different sorts of innovations, different sorts of policy instruments are um, kind of complementary into, into mainstream and nature-based solutions, not just one type. So, so we have the four types and we have also subtypes of policy instruments, but I wouldn't go there because it would take me maybe more than the 15 minutes that I have to explain the subtypes, but you can of course explore it in the Atlas. Then I'll talk a bit more about, well, I'll just mention the instruments now and then I can talk a bit more about what we found about the instruments. So we have our first category is the legislative, regulatory, and strategic instruments. So all sorts of binding regulations, strategies that set visions, laws, right? Then we have the agreement-based or cooperative instruments. And this one is very cool. I really enjoyed understanding how people come together in a voluntary basis at different scales to make nature-based solutions happen. So private and public arrangements, community, uh, governmental arrangements. So this was also very insightful in terms of co-creation. Uh, we also have the economic and fiscal instruments. So we are always saying we don't have enough money to do everything that we want to do. So also understand who is doing well in terms of promoting uh, the availability of funds for making nature-based solutions happen. 
and also this one on knowledge and communication and innovation, which is also nice when we talk about transformation, let's transform behavior, how people is doing that around the world, right? And we wouldn't claim that there is just one instrument that solves everything, probably it's a policy mix, which one? It depends of your city, right? Uh, and your context and, and different experiences. So, okay, this is just the map. We, want, we like to show it because then you can see we have, we, we have countries in Latin America and Europe mainly, but also we were contacted by people from around the world and we showed a couple of best practices from our latitudes. Mm, yeah, and then here, just a bit of a summary of what we found out in the 250 in our 250 sample. So, um, yeah, the instrument that is being more used uh, currently, according to our 250 sample, this is not representative, but this is what we found out by reaching these 41 countries and 48 organizations, is that uh, legislative, regulatory, and strategic instruments are the 47% of kind of the majority of instruments that are supporting NBS. Then we have on the second place the agreement-based or cooperative instruments. Then we have economic and fiscal. And um, with 12%, we have the knowledge, communication, and innovation um, instruments. This, as I said, doesn't mean that only laws will solve it, but for the moment, uh, if we talk about which instruments are supporting the uptake of MBS, for the moment we are still in the loss, in the binding regulations, in the obligations, but we are slowly moving towards innovation and cooperation to also foster MBS action. Um, yes, so this is also an important thing that I wanted to mention. Um, we, when we were trying to understand what is a policy instrument, you would say usually a policy is something or is, is a decision made by a public authority, right? Um, and, and it is, but we wanted really to recognize that nowadays there is a strong civil society making proposals, and we wanted to recognize these bottom-up initiatives that made it into a policy instrument. That means an organized community had an idea, and it was such a strong idea that the government took it up and made it a law or a regulation or a strategy. So even if we can see here in the numbers that there are less, we found less from of those, I really invite you when you open the atlas to take a look at, at how the communities, how different um, stakeholders organized to make nature-based solutions happen and did it so well that they actually influenced policy making. Um, okay, so a bit per region. So in Latin America, we have, and in Europe, we have still that the legislative, regulatory, and strategic instruments are the main ones. Mm, then, for example, in Latin America, we have a combination between economic and fiscal instrument and agreement and cooperative ones. In Latin America, we saw a lot of cooperation between cities at a regional scale. And in Europe, we saw a lot of cooperation, for example, at a local scale. And um, yes, yeah, so, but, but basically, as I said, again, um, still we, are, we have to work a bit more in terms of knowledge, communication, and innovation instruments in both regions, but we see a great potential on it. And well, I'm not going to read all this, promise, but I, I just like to highlight these are our subtypes, right? Because while well, we started saying, okay, we just need to try to understand what sort of legislative instruments are out there, what sort of economic, economic instruments are out there. And me as an urban planner, I really like to see that urban planning mechanisms are playing a key role in mainstreaming nature-based solutions. That's what we found out. So, um, yeah, so how we create cities, how we organize cities, how we decide on protect areas, on manage urban forests are playing a key role uh, in terms of how we, uh, uh, how we foster NBS action. Also, in the economic and fiscal one, for example, we can say the payments as rewards for ecosystem services, the subsidizes, the incentives are playing a key role. So all this, I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but it's just for you to go and explore how this is actually happening. And then the agreement base is a very nice category because you have all sorts of arrangements between different uh, authorities and stakeholders. And I particularly like a lot the public community agreement because it really, the, 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 the community pay, plays a key role in designing, but also in implementing and maintaining MBS. 
And this one, uh, we like it because we are always saying, okay, MBS are multifunctional, have multiple benefits. But here we can see that 95% of the instruments address, address at least three challenges. These are urban challenges that we work on in the, on the interlaced projects. So when we are working with nature-based solutions and mainstreaming them in policy instruments, we are targeting all these urban problems, right? So we are managing green spaces, we are working on human health and well-being, we are working on disaster risk reduction. So this is for us a very strong argument in terms of the multifunctionality of MBS and why it's important to mainstream them in nature-based solutions. And this is an example. This is an example of one of our partner cities, the city of Chemnitz, uh, that works with us on interlace. I bring it just for you to get an idea of the type of content you can find in the 250 policy instruments. These are uh, funding guidelines on green facades that the city of Chemnitz here in Germany is developing. Uh, it is actually one key strategy of the city to transform Chemnitz into a greener city that adapts to climate change. So here we have the, the type of instrument is payment as reward for ecosystem services. The challenge addressed are ecological connectivity, flood risk, heat stress and heat island effect, noise and human health. Then you will have in the Atlas always a governance section that is our, I think our main added value. Governance means what sort of arrangements were made. So uh, here we found out that some of the governance characteristics that make this case a good example are that it works towards silo busting. So the instrument is designed by the city of Chemnitz, but in horizontal collaboration with other city departments. So what we always say, cross departmental um, arrangements. And then when you open the case study, you can see how they did it. The participation aspect, so cities play an active role, they submit their application and are responsible for the implementation and management, so there is a lot of trust building around this, and there is a lot of co-implementation that would help us with the sustainability in, the, in time of the solution of the, or, or of the actions that we are proposing. And also one aspect that came along a lot in terms of a good practice was the policy coherence. So how we also ask them, okay, how are you incorporating this policy instrument into the wider policy framework? What, because we need to be also coherent in terms of the different decisions that are being made in different sectorial policies, et cetera. So in this case, uh, Chemnitz also incorporated this in the, urban, uh, in the master plan for urban nature of the city. So this is the type, you will find 250 of this uh, in the Atlas, so we really invite you to take a look and use it in your projects and use it as an inspiration. And just to finish, I hope I'm still on time. <laughs> um, so a few first observations, just we are currently working on the analysis, I'll mention that later, but just a few first observations of, uh, that we came across while reading 250 cases with McKenna. Um, so currently, out of the 200, uh, policy 250 policy instruments, most instruments are designed and implemented top down, but we see a high potential from bottom up approaches. Um, uh, basically, also there is a potential to use multiple policy instruments to complement each other, especially the knowledge communication and innovation ones. We found a lot of campaigns for nature, letters for, of trees, kind of a lot of things that would help us uh, to make a wider impact of the policy instruments that, for example, are taken by regulations or plans. Um, revenue, also we found out that revenues from environmental damage charges and municipal taxes are often used to finance MBS implementations, but payments, subsidizes, and incentives are more common than these incentives. So we are still encouraging people in, in, instead of kind of punishing them. So this is also interesting. And then for the Latin American region, um, we, and, and, and the, I've had the opportunity to talk about the Atlas in Ecuador and also in Colombia, even if they are still not using our uh, nature-based solution as a concept in all the policies, uh, we, I'm from Colombia myself, so we've been doing it for years with other names, so it's important also to recognize the innovation that Latin American cities are doing. Uh, and even if we are not calling it EDMES, also find synergies and common challenges to also all 
um, yeah, learn from each other in terms of how we have been doing it. Um, yeah, um, with this I finish for now. I hope um, what I wanted to mention is that the Urban Governance Atlas is not at all a finished, closed product, and if you didn't make it into the 250 first examples, you are out, no, all the contrary. So we really invite you to submit uh, your ideas of policy instruments that you have in your cities. Um, you can scan the QR code, and there you can see how we have the Urban Governance Atlas a website and there we have a specific guidelines on how to add your policy instruments and we are currently working and there is still to come an analysis and summary report of what we found out and so we invite you we will let you all know when it's ready so you can read um, more specifically in terms of what did we find out and also we uh, I forgot to say, sorry, this is available in English and Spanish for the moment but we are translating it into other languages so Lots to learn. I hope it excites you as much as it does to us because it's really, really cool product. And yeah, hope you got inspired and then we, we keep chatting about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, lots of information we know, but the, I think the takeaway is that it's online, it's available for everybody. So please come explore um, and we'll have more uh, opportunity later in our discussion to learn more about it. So thanks a lot, Natalia. Um, I would invite our next presenter who's sitting in the front row, Agnieszka Arabas, who's joining us today on behalf, again, of the Interlace Project. Um, Agnieszka is the team coordinator of the team for environment and spatial management in the Krakow metropolitan area, and we're very happy to have you here today. So. Thank you. McKenna for introducing me and for this opportunity to share uh, our efforts uh, to put uh, nature-based solutions uh, into local policy. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, as you are not uh, just a city, uh, I would like to say a few words about our metropolitan area. Uh, we are association of uh, 15 municipalities. Uh, Krakow City and 14 surrounding uh, communes. Uh, associated municipalities cooperate for sustainable development and this uh, cooperation of local governments allows them to go beyond uh, administrative rigid boundaries and increase impact of uh, undertakings, projects and tasks. Um, so, they cooperate for economic and social development uh, by supporting each other, by uh, joint investments and uh, exchanging knowledge and good practices. Three years ago, uh, we have developed a joint uh, supra-local development strategy. Uh, we set up seven um, areas of our collaboration uh, in case of I don't know if I can, no? No, I just wanted to show, but I think, never mind. Uh, so in case of uh, environmental and spatial management, our main goal is to uh, transform into environmentally friendly, uh, climate neutral re region, uh, pro providing high quality of life. And uh, because the striving for climate neutrality and mitigating the climate change effects is very complex, uh, difficult tasks, uh, especially if you are managing 15 municipalities, not only the, the city. Uh, we find this, uh, we, we, are, we were looking for uh, knowledge support, we were looking for expert support, uh, content related, and, and that's why we are happy to, to be part of the Interlace project, as uh, in this project, uh, the cooperation process uh, is based on the local city network accelerator groups. In our case, this group uh, is connecting representatives of municipalities, our 
associated municipalities, but also regional administration institutions and local stakeholders, but also scientists, researchers, and other experts. And uh, in this group, uh, we work together uh, on governance instruments, assessment tools, and participatory process. So, uh, in Krakow metropolitan area, we have three main uh, governance instruments. Uh, first is our strategy for adaptation to climate change. Um, one part of this document, uh, of this document uh, is focused on uh, glue-brain infrastructure development. Another one is uh, action plan for spatial development, uh, supralocal spatial development, and part of this uh, concerns uh, coherence of blue-green infrastructure in uh, spatial policy given the existing and planned uh, function, uh, functions of areas. Mm. Another one uh, is a set uh, of, a maps, uh, of maps of, of vulnerability to climate change. And I will now briefly discuss these uh, three documents. So, uh, when we were uh, preparing the, uh, uh, our uh, strategy for adaptation to climate change, uh, we were discussing the local policy documents and what can we change in these documents uh, to put, uh, put these nature-based solutions into the policy. Uh, we were discussing uh, three documents types, uh, municipal spatial development plan, and uh, for example, uh, we would like to define a minimum uh, biologically active area index for single family development uh, areas. Mm. And uh, we are also collaborating on developing common standards of blue-green infrastructure, like permissions uh, to cover flat roofs and terraces uh, using surface designed as uh, biologically active areas, means putting plants on the roofs. Um, another thing is uh, stormwater uh, management standards. In this case, uh, some of our municipalities uh, provides subsidies uh, for uh, rainwater barrels. Um, we still have a long way to go, uh, but our municipalities are already making efforts to uh, better adapt to climate change using nature-based solutions like rain gardens in the ground and uh, containers, uh, mainly on uh, municipal... Uh, 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 lands like schools, uh, backyards, uh, municipal uh, yards. Uh, and these uh, investments have an uh, educational but also demonstration aspects because they are uh, encouraging citizens uh, to put similar uh, efforts and adopt similar solutions on their own uh, backyards. Another uh, example is rainwater filtering roundabout, uh, which collects uh, rainwater from streets, sidewalks, and uh, bicycle paths. Uh, more and more popular green walls or permeable surfaces on uh, parking lots or under uh, the trees uh, on public spaces. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of our governance uh, instruments is a special management plan concerning the coherence of blue-green infrastructure. Uh, to implement this, we use our functional and spatial model, uh, which one of the layers presents uh, the main air run of channels. Uh, these are those blue uh, triangles and the river systems marked with green. This here is uh, better visible. Uh, our activities in this case uh, are focused on counteracting the disturbance of the main uh, air run of gutters uh, due to intensive urban development and maintaining the continuity of rivers natural areas beyond uh, administrative boundaries. 
The third tool uh, combines the previous two uh, and is focused on raising awareness of our stakeholders uh, on the existing threats and presents how to deal with uh, these problems with uh, nature-based solutions. So, like many other cities and regions, our metropolis faces many uh, challenges due to climate changes, uh, like air pollution, fires, uh, periodic droughts uh, and heat waves, uh, floods and landslides, decline in biodiversity. Solving such complex uh, problems requires knowledge and the ability to show the data in a way that everyone understands. In our case, the vulnerability to climate change maps uh, turned out to be success. The most important thing from our uh, point of view uh, is that uh, these maps present the real threat because uh, they pre uh, the presented data takes uh, into account factors, two factors like uh, exposure, which describes the proximity of people, structures, and ecosystems uh, to ongoing risks and hazards. And from the other side, the sensitivity, uh, which comprises the degree to which those risks uh, impacts the social assets and ecosystems. And for example, the map of the vulnerability to air pollution uh, reflects the concentration of uh, air pollution, but in terms uh, of the place of residence uh, below uh, <laughs> residents of citizens below 14 and above 65 years old, because these are most sensitive groups of our population. Similarly, the map of vulnerability to heat presents areas with the highest temperatures noticed during the heat waves, but taking uh, into account the places of residence of seniors uh, because they are more likely to experience the negative uh, consequences of heat stress. So how uh, did we decide um, which factors and filters to include? We engage local stakeholders uh, in the map co-creation process, uh, mainly municipal officials uh, responsible for spatial planning, water management, maintenance of urban greenery, uh, or air quality improvement. As a result, the criteria have been uh, carefully selected to reflect the specific context and challenges of Krakow metropolitan area. Thanks to the development of the vulnerability to climate change maps, uh, we were able to better understand the problems we were facing. And uh, for example, uh, the greatest vulnerability to fires in Krakow metropolitan area um, is not on the forested outskirts of the city, but in its very center due to the uh, uh, population of citizens, uh, density of uh, population and uh, strategic infrastructure. So uh, thanks to these tools, uh, official can better adapt the planned activities to the local needs. In the next step, we want to create another map showing uh, which nature-based solution would efficiently respond to the challenges uh, showed of these maps. This will equip us and our uh, partner municipalities uh, with a particularly pragmatic tool uh, which will help us uh, to um, develop specific types, uh, types of NBS in specific spots and areas. Uh, in the future, maps will be used in the process of making strategi strategic uh, decisions in spatial planning, like uh, appropriate nature-based solution protect protection of ecological corridors or continuity of river systems. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Perfectly on time. Makes my job easy. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so that was a great introduction, I think, of what you've done in the city, and we're going to go a little bit more into detail of things you teased a little bit about working with different departments, different municipalities, different actors in our discussion, but we leave it there for now. And our final presentation, and then we go into our interactive session, so we would invite our last speaker, Santiago Sandoval, up again. For those of you in the last session, he also presented, which is a good introduction to your presentation now, where I think you go a little bit more in depth about how this worked in practice. 
So Santiago is here on behalf of the Clever Cities project. As I said, we have two hats on today. Um, he's the Secretary of Environment in Quito, probably has one of the longest uh, journeys here. So thank you very much for joining our panel. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Bueno, voy, a, voy nuevamente. <laughs> um, <and> me again. <laughs> Um, well, the blue-green ordinance, uh, as a successful example of NBS implementation in our city, and I will explain the green-blue green policy. Uh, it's commend, uh, commendable to hear about the, this recent policy development um, as outlined in, in ordinance uh, approved in the last July. Uh, this policy represents a significant shift in the city visions, emphasis and transition from traditional gray infrastructure to one of the priorities blue-green infrastructure, including um, NBS. Uh, this change is perspective it is a major step forward in addressing the needs of the population. It not only leads uh, to the creation of more green and recreational spaces, but also plays a crucial role in mitigating vulnerabilities to climate events. Uh, by focusing on NBS, the city is taking a proactive measure to combat issues like floods, landslides, and heat episodes, uh, thereby um, in changing the overall resilience and well-being of, um, of its residents. Uh, this forward-thinking approach is likely to have a positive and lasting impact on the city urban environmental and quality uh, urban and, and rural environmental environment and the quality of life for these inhabit in, inhabitants. Um, well, the problems before to explain the, um, the key initiatives uh, within the green blue policy. I want to mention some problems we were facing in the case of of the Monja Rivers is one of the case of the study, which has been associated with environmental problems because of the discharge uh, from uh, nearby factories and nearby uh, urban areas. This area has erosion problems due to the increasing of uh, water flows uh, affecting the river banks and surrounding areas. Um, uh, well, um, we have um, geographic conditions where the city uh, sidles, uh, ravines and mountains uh, sites, chaotic urban growth uh, close to the ravines, mountains and sites and rivers, um, uh, fluor waterproofing and vegetation degradation, and modification of natural slopes, deviation of rivers and filling with ways of civil construction. The effect of this action resulted in erosion increase, uh, floods, landslides, um, and climate vulnerability affecting uh, the style and the quality of life. Um, well, the key initiatives, um, although the green-blue policy has been created recently, it's evident that we have achieved a concerted effort to incorporate NBS uh, into the local legislation and long-term planning in our city, well, long and short-term uh, short planning in our city. Uh, overall, these initi initiatives represent a holistic approach to the urban planning uh, with a strong emphasis of sustainability, climate resilience, and community engagement. Uh, the integration of NBS uh, into the local legislation and uh, long-term plans reflects a forward-thinking vision for the city future. Um, and I will say the, a little summary of the key in initiatives. Uh, co-created um, ordinance. Uh, the ordinance was developed uh, based on sentences uh, issued by the Constitutional Court on January uh, 2020. Um, the citizens, along with technical organizations, has the opportunity to actively participate in the formulation of the ordinance through the joint working groups with municipal entities at the Metropolitan Council. And the cross department collaboration, uh, various key in initiatives, including the Secretary of the Environment and the Secretary of Land, Habitat and Housing, uh, the Secretary of Security and Governance, and uh, the Secretary of Territorial Coordination, uh, Drinking Water and Sanitation Entity, and the Public Works Municipal Entity working together in formulating the ordinance. 
Uh, we reviewed the ordinance in four months, uh, which is uh, unbelievable, but we did because the ordinance was uh, working uh, for the last two years, but uh, was working from the top to the bottom. So in four months, we changed the conditions and we called to all the population and rebuild the, the ordinance from the bottom to the top just in four months. Uh, it was a very hard work, but um, we did it. Um, uh, the cross, uh, well, the vision um, of blue-green infrastructure, uh, the, collaborate, uh, the collaborative effort has led a shift in perspective, moving away from in, in previous view and traditional grade infrastructure towards models of uh, permeability and blue-green infrastructure, uh, the focus on NBS and SUT, sustainable urban design system, demonstrate a commitment to sustainable and climate resilient urban development, um, ongoing planning and implement, uh, implementation. Um, while the ordinance has been approved, there is still work to be done in designing and generation plans relate uh, to the development and maintenance of blue green infrastructure. Uh, the overchanging goal uh, of the ordinance is to protect and care the life, the natural heritage, promote connectivity, uh, rehabilitate the city, and uh, preserve uh, rivers, and uh, treat uh, wastewater, among other measures aimed at reducing climate vulnerability. Integration into long-term plans. Uh, NBAs have uh, been integrated in long-term plans, uh, such as the Metropolitan Plan for, for Development and Territorial Planning, and the Plan of Land Use and Management, uh, recognizing the potential in mitigation climate uh, risk. Um, Urban Trees Ordinance. Uh, the Urban Trees Ordinance underscores the city commitment uh, to green in urban environments with a specific emphasis on uh, protecting trees and promoting the NBA's approach. So it was a really hard work, but here's one of the um, interventions that we use the NBS in a national framework. Maybe we get our helpers to help us move the podium, please. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. I think it's um, really nice examples, not least coming after the last session. For those of you who are here learning about the urban greening plans and this idea that nature should be integrated and mainstreamed, not in a dedicated strategy necessarily, coming on top of the existing requirements and obligations that cities have, but should rather be thought of um, as... Uh, <laughs> thank you very much as an effort to um, be integrated in many existing policies, right? Across different sectors, across different ideas, that NBS is really a consideration. Um, think in, uh, sure, thanks, yeah. Thought of in a more integrated approach um, and holistic approach. So thanks very much for the examples and also really inspiring four months is amazing. We heard in the last session about the EU nature restoration law that's coming and the fact that that will take quite some time still probably um, to get passed and put into action. So four months is definitely very inspiring. So you guys have been a fantastic audience. Everyone is still awake as far as I can tell. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, we're now in the more interactive part. So we have a little panel discussion planned, but I think what I said in the beginning holds true. We really want to engage you, learn from you, not only from our, our great speakers today, but really hear from you as well. Learn from your experiences, hear if you have any good examples. So start thinking already maybe about your questions or if you have any impulses that you'd like to give about um, a success story of integrating NBS into your local policies in a, in a city context or a regional context. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to start with a couple of questions just to get the conversation going and then we would go around with the microphone and invite all of you to join in in a very informal and open discussion. So, who is the lucky first candidate who would like to volunteer? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I can ask you, um, Agnieszka Fleiss, maybe that we were talking a lot about this kind of cross-departmental, cross-sectoral collaboration. You were saying you work together with lots of municipalities and you really push this idea of nature-based solutions. But sometimes one of the challenges that we have is how to actually sell nature-based solutions when you're talking to different, different audiences. So I just didn't know from your experience, how did you actually get the different actors on board to participate in the conversation and to actually support nature-based solutions in practice? <clears throat> so, um, in Krakow metropolitan area, uh, in our office works only 20 people. Uh, so we don't have really specialists uh, for uh, uh, blue-green infrastructure or wastewater management system. You, if we define the problem or uh, we have things to discuss, like new responsibilities uh, for municipalities. Uh, like uh, each one needs to have uh, this adaptation plan. We invite uh, specialists working already in municipalities. We invite them uh, to our office to discuss the problem, the possible solutions, and what we can do all together to solve the problem, how we can support each other to make uh, better impact, uh, better results of, the, uh, of this effort. Uh, so we have uh, like uh, uh, more, than tens, uh, more than 10 working groups uh, in specific topics like uh, climate change uh, or wastewater management, uh, uh, waste management, uh, spatial planning, and uh, if we find this uh, needed, we gather um, two, or three of the two, or three groups all together, like spatial planning and climate change. If we talk about nature-based solutions, we need not only uh, specialists for uh, blue-green infrastructure. It's not enough. We need also spatial planists uh, to discuss uh, the possible solutions. That's how we work. Thanks a lot. Do you have anything to add? Otherwise, I have another question for you. Another question, perfect. Um, so we're talking a lot about how co-creation is really important, involving different actors, trying to reach um, across the different sectors, as we just heard, within the government, but also out to the public. And I heard a rumor that yesterday you were talking about the importance of local knowledge and getting that, capturing that. So I just wanted to know, how is that working in practice in Quito? No, Natalia, ¿me ayudas traduciendo un poco? Sí. A ver, eh, como, <ríe> como dije en la, en la anterior intervención, eh, lo más importante que tiene Quito es su gente. So as he, sorry about my bad translation, I'm not an official translator, but uh, Santiago is saying that uh, the most important that Quito has, has is, is, is their, the people, their citizens. Y eh, muchas veces el, la parte política olvida el, el conocimiento tradicional que tiene la comunidad. And many times the politicians forget about the local knowledge and the traditional knowledge of the communities. En el caso de la ordenanza verde azul, eh, fueron trabajo de dos años sin, la, sin, la, sin contar con la, la um, participación de la ciudadanía. Okay, so in the, can, in the case of the blue-green ordinance, it was for two years uh, they were working without consulting the citizens. Por eso, el, en la nueva administración regresamos a la participación local y apenas en dos meses pudimos eh, crear mesas de trabajo con un enfoque muy, muy local y muy eh, participativo de, del trabajo. So this is why in the new administration that Santiago represents, uh, they decided to come back to communities and in two months they created working groups with different stakeholders to get them involved into the policy making process. La decisión política eh, viene desde la gente y eso es lo que hace cambiar las, eh, bueno, la diferencia entre un político y otro político, una administración y otra administración. So, he is saying that they recognize in this administration that the power and the political decisions should be with the people, and this is what differentiates one administration from the others. 
socialmente el poder lo tiene la gente y los políticos están trabajando para la gente y es algo que muchas veces olvidan como tomadores de decisiones. La política viene desde la base social hacia el tomador de decisión. So the power lies on the people and sometimes the public decision makers um, forget that when they are in power that the people are the power. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to add from uh, Krakow's experience? Uh, can you repeat the whole question? <laughs> yeah, just about, um, we're talking a lot about co-creation, involving different stakeholders. You were saying you involve scientists, you involve the research community, you involve different politicians, different members of society, just how that worked in practice. And if you were trying to inspire other cities to do the same, what, what kind of tips you would give them? Yes, uh, so, um, Some of the challenges uh, we're facing are really difficult, complex, uh, and some of our rural municipalities, uh, they don't hire very qualified people, or one person is responsible for different topics. And so for those people who are not mean, mean, uh, feeling safe Uh, or they don't know what to do. They know they need to or prepare some plan or uh, some strategic documents, but they're not feeling uh, so comfortable with these tasks. Uh, we uh, try to collaborate uh, with experts in the topic, invite scientists, researchers, or people who already prepared such documents, such policies. Uh, we invite them to uh, give a speech, to answer the questions, um, to give a good practices examples, uh, just, you know, to stay in touch with them so our uh, uh, people from municipalities could uh, stay in touch, uh, ask questions, uh, discuss their problems. Thanks a lot. Um, Natalia, one question for you, and then I'm going to the audience, so be ready with your questions, please. Um, yeah, so I have a biased view on this, but I'll ask you, what do you think how the Urban Governance Atlas can actually support what we're talking about today, support cities in mainstreaming nature-based solutions? How can they use it? Yes, I think, as I said in my, in my presentation, um, I mean, when you... Can, when you have the possibility of getting inspired by what about what 200 like the actions and the good and the efforts of 250 different initiatives this is really enriching right because and and, and what I really like about the Atlas not because that we worked on it but it's, it's really nice that you can have practical even tips and recommendations on different sorts of aspects that would uncover, would also kind of help you and inspire you through all the difficulties of a public decision uh, making process, right? So we have insights on governance, what were the arrangements, who worked with whom, did they did, how did they do it, so that how does that take shape, right? So is it an intermunicipal working table, is it a Uh, I don't know, it's an advisory board, right? So we have very practical like, con concrete actions that were taken and that shown to be uh, uh, successful in different contexts. So I think that is very nice, inspiring. For, from my perspective, it was a great learning process. And I think it can help also, well, that's one of the things, like the diversity of the knowledge and of the practices there. But also I think the fact that we uh, worked with different types of policy instruments, a subtype of policy instrument, also recognizes a lot of the potential coming from different sectors, from different, um, from different ways of uh, approaching public policy, right? So there is not just one policy that would be the magical one that would make us our cities greener, right? It's a combination of efforts, and then you can make the case on it when you show your politicians and when you show your communities and when you are making plans that it's important to go towards policy coherence and that it's about a combination of, of instruments that can help in different ways to mainstream MBS. So yeah, I think it's very inspiring, it's very enriching and I, it brings a lot of aspects um, uh, yeah, for, for, the, for the discussion on how to make MBS happen. 
Thanks very much. I think you hit on a really important point, which is that it's very, a lot of times the policy instruments needing to support, needed to support nature-based solutions are very locally dependent and very context dependent. But the atlas and the experiences that we've heard today, I think there's a lot of shared commonalities that can be extracted that can help to formulate those policies and those instruments. So yeah, we invite you to explore the atlas. If your city is not featured and you want to be, please get in contact afterwards. But maybe this is a good opportunity to highlight what your cities have done if we don't know about them yet. So is there anyone in the audience as a first question who's here on behalf of a city or from the research community or from a different group who has a good example of NBS mainstreaming in practice to complement what we've already heard? and wants to share. Yeah, please. Please just introduce yourself and then the obviously clever connection. Is it on? Yeah. My name is Thomas Jakob from the city of Hamburg from the mayor's office. And uh, so working since decades and in policy, we found that branding against policy is quite important. Uh, Nature-based solutions sounds like a niche product. Uh, but uh, attractive city, prospering city, that's greater. And to transform then concepts into policy decisions, which unlock some millions and investments are much easier than to do something nice. So disaster resilient is much more attractive for policy than to have a nice green park where people can feel fine. Uh, and after we saw floodings due to the climate change, uh, so everybody was keen from the policy scenery. Wherever I look around the continent or the world, says that we have to do something. Otherwise, our city will flood it with billions of damages and casualties and dead people. Uh, and so we took this uh, principle of a sponge city, just to catch the water in the underground instead of putting it in drainage systems and then have this standardized solution, which we regard as a kind of nature-based solutions, but not in the countryside, where we have just the retention areas, but put it in the city concept. So the sponge city concept, not as a nature-based solution, nice to have solution, but a really serious solution to protect a city against floodings, which we saw in mega cities or in, in other countries. So as soon as we have this attractive and put it from the level of having a nice to have solution, which is important, no doubt, but to transform it into a policy instrument, it's much easier to have the economical aspect quite clear defined uh, and we saw it in early this year in, in Auckland in New Zealand when the inner city was totally flooded. This was a disaster. Not for ugly to have this but it was an economical disaster in the long term. So this may be a good way to transform ideas into concepts into political solutions which may lead to a number of administrative and funding schemes and whatever uh, in order to give uh, regulations uh, to, to install something and to form future investments of the city in places and in urban planning and whatever. So this was for us a good experience uh, to have this water management, nature-based solution and sponge instead of drainage, uh, a solution which can be regarded and which uh, had a big response and big acceptance, a huge acceptance in all policy levels. Thanks a lot. Yeah, a really important message, I think, is this branding and communicating with different stakeholder groups. I think sometimes um, in the NBS world, we get very caught up in this concept of nature-based solutions, but miss a little bit what's the foundation of it. What are we actually talking about? So thinking about having the message, sharing the message, promoting the message, and supporting the message, both economically and politically, but maybe not always using that same branding that we're using here today by knowing our different audiences. So thanks a lot for that example. Uh, any other examples from our audience here? Yeah, please. And just to say while the microphone is being handed, if you explore the clever guidance, I think it was presented this morning, then there's also some tips and papers and um, helpful resources on there that we've learned from clever cities about branding, about targeting our different audiences and how to maybe um, yeah, gain some support for nature-based solutions. So building on what was just shared. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Tanya McDonald and I'm based in Dundee, Scotland right now. So we are part of one of the Horizon European funded um, programs for urban relief. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, um, but that is one of the places. And I've basically been doing that and they're doing everything around like mental health and also air pollution and basically helping citizens embed nature-based solutions within the city. But for my PhD, I'm a self-funded student that's based at a botanic garden and talking about how that botanic garden 
impacts the, the community and the society around it and what that looks like right now, but potentially for the future as well. So using like World Cafe methodology, the Three Horizons. Um, and then on top of that, I also was working with um, the Eden Project. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. So based down in Cornwall, um, a lot of people know them for their biodomes. They actually have like the largest uh, rainforest in captivity, uh, but they're actually creating a new one in Dundee. And it basically feels like they're really on like really the cusp of something amazing. It's a lot of different people working together collaboratively. So yeah, that's just kind of an example for us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, super great examples. I think it's always good to compliment uh, the speakers that we select with all of you in the audience. So thanks a lot for that. I would open it up for more examples in a moment. But first, do we have any questions for our lovely speakers here? Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Doris Knoblau from Ecologic Institute. Um, so I'm a colleague and I sit down again. And um, I'm a participation enthusiast. So um, I have a participation specific question to you. Um, um, do you have any hints on how to ensure that if you are targeting citizens with your participation, so um, citizens as stakeholders, how to ensure that you reach also those who typically do not take part in participation processes, for instance, um, young people or elderly people or socially marginalized people, because if you do um, the usual things, then the usual people respond, but how to reach the others beyond the usual suspects. So um, do you have any tips on that? Because if we talk about mainstreaming it, which this is the overarching topic and putting theory into practice, this is also very critical, at least in my view. Thank you. Gracias, Natalia. <laughs> Eh, creo que, eh, a ver, eh, construir política pública creo que no es como Disneylandia, no puedes, eh, digamos, ser, hacer felices a todos, pero sí tienes que tener eh, muy identificados los grupos de trabajo de cualquier tipo de rango de edad. So, uh, to design a public policy, it's not like Disneyland, you cannot keep everyone happy, but uh, what is important is to identify different stakeholders and different uh, actors that you are going to work with. For example, in the Ordenanza Verde Azul, hubo dos años de pelea entre el gobierno y el grupo sociales. For example, in the process of the Blue-Green Ordinance, there, was, uh, there were two years of uh, disputes between the government and the local communities. Pero si tienes la capacidad de identificar los grupos eh, cabeza, los grupos importantes, digamos el trabajo funciona mucho mejor y el tipo de enfoque que das a la a la política pública. But um, when you have the capacity or develop the capacity of identifying the groups that you are working with and the leaders within those groups, then uh, you would advance into a more inclusive. Para nosotros eh, es más allá de la infraestructura, es importante la vida, la calidad de vida que tienes, el bienestar de la vida más allá de la infraestructura. Y eso hace que seas mucho más cerca, cercano a la, a la población. So for us, uh, beyond infrastructure, we are dealing with human lives and from that perspective, so building from that perspective, uh, they are closer to the people and to hearing people out. Thank you. Thanks very much. Agneska, do you have another answer? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, uh, my office doesn't work with uh, citizens directly, uh, but uh, I know some tricks of our municipalities. So for example, uh, to attract uh, senior citizens, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, they don't use internet uh, or uh, they don't uh, really attract in what's going on in poly, uh, political world, uh, not anymore, most of them. Um, 
So they, if they are uh, organizing a meeting uh, uh, and they want to attract senior citizens, they put uh, 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 information in uh, where, where those uh, people spending their time. Uh, so in the parks, uh, in the shopping center, uh, in church. Uh, so uh, they put uh, advertisement or they uh, going there and uh, try to connect with those people, try to uh, engage them personally. Uh, in case of uh, women's, uh, uh, it's good to organize uh, meetings uh, in late hours, after working hours, after dinner, uh, like 6 p.m., 7 p.m., uh, when they are finally have some time uh, to focus on uh, different topics. Uh, and uh, in case of uh, young generation, uh, we have uh, some good experiences uh, from Interlace project. Um, we were uh, implementing our engagement program, uh, which, were, uh, which was uh, focused on Minecraft uh, video game. It was a big success in our uh, metropolitan area. Uh, we, select, uh, we selected uh, pri primary schools. We, uh, together with them, we selected uh, urban space uh, in one of our municipality. And then uh, our partner, Opla, uh, they created this place uh, in this video game. I bet you know all this Minecraft game because it's very popular. Mm. And then children could work on this space in the game. Uh, providing nature-based solutions to make this place, this space, more attractive to them and uh, more useful for environment. So they were planting trees, they were putting some uh, lakes uh, in the middle of uh, market square. Uh, they were having fun, but they were also understanding what are they doing and what for. Another example uh, is uh, Learning Tour. It's uh, a game also in, a, in an app uh, where you need to go uh, in the real world but with an application. And we, when you are in a, um, this uh, very spot, you need to answer the question or make a task related to what you see or uh, what you could do in this place to change it for a better place. So it, this very, I find this very successful and very engaging for young people. Thanks a lot for the examples. Yeah, I think it's, it's always really interesting to think about the different forms of communication, the different forms of media, the different forms of um, planning that are needed to reach these different target groups. So that's some really good examples of that. Thanks a lot. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Hello, Gyokshan from Ikle Europe. I have a question for Natalia. You mentioned you showed the percentages about the kind of policies that are coming from, I mean, in forms of legislation and from the local side, which is more or less the same percentage. Do you have any examples where kind of this, I mean, first of all, this is how I saw on the graph, is it the case? Or which one is kind of more impactful full, when it comes from top down or from bottom up? And I think a kind of third question is that do you have any good examples where kind of this bottom-up approach inspired a good kind of top-bottom legislation that can kind of scale up the one municipality's examples to others? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll... Okay, so um, I wouldn't... I'll try to, <laughs> to give you an answer that hopefully... Uh, it's good enough because anyways, we read 250, so I have a couple in my mind. I don't have all of them present. But first of all, I wouldn't say there is one way of like being more impactful. As I said, there is a diversity of ways that are successful depending on uh, many things, right? Like who is working with, with whom, and what are the political uh, infrastructures and the political will, etc. cetera, right? Um, so currently, it seems like in this 250 sample, right, uh, what we found is like there are more laws like, and, and binding regulations that are doing this because they set the scene, 
right? So if sometimes in some context, if there is not in, like the obligation, then you don't start working on it. So it's kind of, I, I would say it's maybe a first step. It's kind of, there is a political will, as Santiago was saying, of working with MBS, working for nature. And then around that, you have a constellation of things happening, right? Like you are trying to make arrangements then to, for example, implement that law, right? Um, uh, now I think about maybe two examples of, of how that works. So we there are um, um, in Bogota, I mean, I have that example because it's from my city. Uh, there was uh, this association of citizens coming together to protect the um, the Cerros Orientales, like the uh, East uh, Hills, but it's not a hill, it's a big mountain. <laughs> and then uh, basically these citizens were working together doing urban gardens and actually protecting uh, or advocating for the protection of the land because it's a land that really wants to be urbanized. So they organize the community, they have volunteers, they work with universities. And what happened is that when there were, or I say we because I was working in the municipality back then, uh, when we were working on the urban master plan of Bogota, uh, we knew of the work that they were doing because they, they had basically maps of what was happening and they knew every tree, they knew every, they knew that mountain as the, as the like by heart. So we took their input to define a, a protected area in the urban master plan. We call it zona de amortiguamiento, that means a, an area between kind of the city and, 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 the, and the buildings that are already in the mountain and the protected area. And so we created this transition space when certain things could happen in terms of recreation. So it was very interesting kind of how their experience turned into an urban planning decision. So that one I have it in mind is in the Urban Governance Atlas. Uh, um, so it's called Reserva. Uh, Cerros Orientales Bogotá. Uh, it's also available in English for you to check it, to, to take a look. But yeah, I think I, I would say that. And then we have 250 examples of, of how that happens. And, and also, yeah, there are fewer that we found out that were bottom up. Uh, also, that's, that's more difficult to grasp. That's, that's not necessarily, uh, you, you just don't go to a municipality website and find that out. So it was also, um, yeah, we, 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 we gather those by reaching out to people and talking to people, but we are sure that there are many more there. It's just we need to get to know about them, and this is why we also need your help to, to get to know about those and get inspired. Thanks a lot. And maybe just to complement that, I think it's important to note our criteria for it was that the bottom-up initiatives we included were all formalized by or recognized by the local government. So there's lots more bottom-up NBS initiatives that aren't included here, but the kinds of instruments we included were all formally recognized and formally mainstreamed by the governments. That's why it's less here. Yes, so I go back to our current slide. Um, I would have more questions, but uh, maybe somebody else has one. Yeah, I see a hand in the back. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Philip Winter. I'm an urban designer from Hamburg, and my question is regarding the local knowledge and local practices. Um, Santiago, you earlier said that it was really important to take local, yeah, the local knowledge into consideration and also build your designs um, on top of it. Um, but uh, my question is, what if the local practices or the local knowledge are actually part of the problem? What if there's practices that have been there for decades or even for generations, and we see that they are degrading the environment or they have other negative negative impact, how do we get people to, first of all, realize that there might be a problem, and then in a second step, how do we get them to change it without being, you know, patronizing or without, you know, coming from a top-down level? So how do we convince people to do that? Maybe a question for you, but also I think you have many experiences uh, in this regard. Thank you very much. Um, is, bueno, it's is very interesting, your question. Uh, el, creo que um, lo más importante es poder entender que eh, el, la, el conocimiento ancestral, el, comienzo, el conocimiento tradicional hace que el, el, la persona, el humano es parte de la naturaleza, no está sobre la naturaleza. 
Y eso cambia completamente el, el, la forma de crear política pública. So the most important thing would be to understand that the traditional knowledge, the ancestral knowledge, uh, recognizes that uh, the nature is kind of in the same level or up even above the, the people, right? So that changes the perspective. Y eso hace que la infraestructura, la política pública, la forma de administrar eh, la forma de crear eh, completamente está compartida con esa, ese, ese conocimiento y crecimiento que tienes desde las poblaciones. So that would mean that the way you create infrastructure, infrastructure policy, eh, it would be compatible with also the people's need, needs. Pensamos que, eh, digamos, acercar a la gente a la zona urbana, pero es al revés la zona urbana a, digamos, el territorio como tal. Desconocemos cómo funciona el territorio, desconocemos cómo la gente eh, interactúa entre unos y otros. So, urban citizens uh, would maybe not understand how the territories work, right? So, uh, yeah, he was saying basically, uh, people living in cities, we need to make them closer to nature. Gracias. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to add or we would take another question? I can only shortly uh, uh, add that uh, in our case, those vulnerability maps are a really good tool to show the, the challenges because it's visible. It's not the Excel data, you know, uh, or some uh, dry information like, uh, oh, we uh, noticed two millimeters rainwater uh, more this year. Uh, to, you know, common people doesn't understand if it's much or not. Is it something special? Uh, two millimeters sounds like nothing. So uh, raw data means nothing, but the pictures says, uh, say much more than, than just... Uh, the, the dry information. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, yes. Uh, may I say, this is, a, as it really said, a walk on the razor's blade, uh, what you mentioned. So I'm an urban planner by myself, and I know this behavior that we planners know best how the world for, should function. And all the others who do not follow us are idiots. So we know it, because we studied it, and we are in our bubble. And, uh, but in the end, if we behave like that with our, with our demands to nature-based solutions, we are going out of democracy. We are going out and we are risking uh, to be like idealists pushed in a crazy corner which are not following the basic of our societies. If we follow that and say, you are the part of the problem, that's why you are an idiot. <laughs> follow us. And if you do not understand, we know we have the wisdom. So this is a risk, I think. Uh, we should be aware of that. Not to be the teachers against all the other idiots of Nobel Prize winners in un, un, unimportant disciplines. Uh, we know how the world is, where the cities can survive. And so I think we should try to include this knowledge and not say we have the knowledge and you not. And this is really a risk in the policy process to implement solutions, because we are the owner of the truth. And this is, this is something where we, as I'm afraid we will fail in the end, as long as we are in this position. We should include this, and if people want to do crazy things, okay, let them do something crazy things. And even the English parks and gardens are from the nature-based solutions. They are crazy, anyhow, biodiversity and so on. But in the end, people like it, and people vote for that. And if you say, sorry, you won't get an English garden, Okay, we will not be re-elected, and then we can make a dictatorship of NBS. So that's not a solution in my point of view, and this is a balance we have to find. Thank you for that. As you said uh, in your introduction, walking on razor blades. So I think, uh, yeah, walking on eggshells is the right expression for your comments. I think it's uh, good to keep in mind, but also that, of course, we're trying to be integrative and trying to take account of lots of different stakeholder groups, perspectives, knowledge, and everything else, and try to work together towards a more sustainable future is our, our shared goal, I think. Um, so we're running out of time now. I would ask... Uh, 
another question as a conclusion, but first I want to see if there's any burning questions from our audience. One more question that anybody has. No. Okay, then I would end the round um, with my personal interest, which is basically, um, yeah, you've both shared a lot of examples, also from the Urban Governance Atlas, about inspiring examples of mainstreaming nature-based solutions in practice, how it's worked, how you've integrated different stakeholders, integrated different municipal, municipal actors. Um, but of course, we're talking about turning this theory into practice. So if you had to kind of summarize a lesson learned, and you could give one city one lesson learned, what would it be? that you take away from this experience? Yeah, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> uh, I think for us, um, the lesson learned from Interlace project uh, is this uh, uh, engagement program and participatory process. The effort put, uh, that was put in this uh, co-creation process was worth, worth the, uh, the work and it was something new for us to collaborate uh, uh, with people outside of our municipalities, but it was definitely worth it. And I'm, thank, I'm really thankful for this uh, support and this knowledge how to do this. Thank you. Um, well, I'm not from a municipality currently, but maybe, I mean, in my past life as a Colombian <laughs> and decision maker, I was working there in, in the Ministry of Planning. I would say the processes where we managed to create trust um, and that means a, a lot of self um, kind of reflection and a lot of uh, also really kind of willingness to hear others. That from my perspective really had amazing results when we really sat down and honestly talk about things for long periods of time because as, as, as you said with the, your question, like we all are different, right? We have different perspectives, we have different practices, so Basically, building trust takes time, but it's worth it, and that should be also recognized in the institutional processes. So it's not just about gathering and chatting, but having some working tables, some uh, working groups that actually are kind of co-creating the process. So I think trust building uh, would be my my kind of sentence that I would like to to yeah to have in mind when I have again the opportunity to be in a a public policy making process. Creo que uh, el, el mejor, eh, digamos, forma de, de construir es acercar, digamos, los, los extremos que están ahora entre, digamos, la izquierda extrema y la derecha extrema. Entonces, creo que hay un hueco muy grande entre ciudadanos, entre la sociedad como tal que hace que no se pueda viabilizar una ciudad o una sociedad más allá de una sociedad, de una ciudad. So Santiago is saying that he believes that the best way of uh, creating things together and building things together is to make an effort to uh, bring the extreme, sometimes political view that creates opposition together. So kind of find a middle ground to really be, yeah, bring people together towards a collective goal. Y creo que reconstruir la base social es lo más importante para poder, eh, digamos, reconstruir una, una ciudad o una forma de vivir. So he believes a key way of um, rebuilding a city is also to work on rebuilding or building the social construct, the social networks, the social bases. Thanks very much. Um, I think I don't want to say more. I want to end on those inspiring words, uh, exactly fulfilling my hope that you really give our audience something to take away today. So I hope that you guys found some inspiration, that we could light a spark of inspiration, of uh, motivation to go out and try to put this theory into practice, learning from our cities, learning from our research community, and really go out and try to help mainstream nature-based solutions in your local context. So thanks a lot, and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening.